eyes have seen so many other things. Our eyes have seen so many other people. And yet there is a longing in our hearts to see Jesus. Father, tonight we have come not because of a personality, not because of the music, not because of friends, but because we believe that seeing Jesus will make a change in our lives. There are so many people who are here tonight with longings in their hearts because they recognize that as close as they have been to Jesus, they have never, ever in their lives been close enough. So tonight, Father, open our eyes. I put all that I have and all that I am into your hands, my Father. And I ask that you will set me aside and let Jesus be seen. This is my prayer. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Tonight we come talking about relationships. Incidentally, let's say amen for the music tonight. Amen. Now those, uh, that, that praise team, I kind of like them. What do you say? They're going to sing that song every night. And by the time you leave here, you ought to be able to sing that song with them. Some of you will sing it so well that people in the audience will pull you out to know that you ought to be a star somewhere. But uh, anyway, that's the song. Uh, my friends Pam and Jimmy Rhodes have come all the way from Tennessee. How many of you know how far Tennessee is from, from Toronto? A long, long, long way. But these are my dear friends who have been ministering in music and in many other ways for so many years. Pam and Jimmy, I know you love me now. Because if you drive all the way from Tennessee to help the poor preacher out, I owe you. <laughs> okay? Let's give them another handful. This is Pam and Jimmy Rhodes from, from Tennessee. Now let me tell you why you need to pray a little bit extra tonight. I will tell you this, some of you have seen me on television and you may think that people who are on television somehow get caught up in themselves. I do not. Anything good that comes out of my mouth comes out because of Jesus. Amen. I'll tell you that from the beginning. God deserves all the glory and all the credit for any good thing that ever happened in my life. I don't take credit for one thing. But tonight, I need a little special prayer in his why. The devil got so disturbed about this meeting that he began to do some amazing things. My wife and I went out to catch the plane yesterday to come to Toronto. Some of you who have been watching the Weather Channel know that there has been a weather system that's been right along the top of the United States for a few days now. We stood in the line, stood in the line, the time for the plane to take off came and went, and we stood there for three more hours, and guess what they said? The plane can't leave. I said, well, how about the next plane? They said, that's canceled. I said, how about the plane in the morning? They said, that's canceled. How about the plane tomorrow afternoon? That's canceled. I said, well, when can you get me to Toronto? They said, we can probably get you to Toronto 10 o'clock on Saturday evening. Come on, folks, you ought to say, ooh. <laughs> that, that hasn't even come yet, has it? So my wife and I said, we've got to be in Toronto tomorrow evening. And there's only one way we're going to get there. We called the trains. They said, take about 24 hours, 23, 22, get you there. And so we went and got a car. Got in the car last night at about 9 o'clock and started driving. And we drove all night long. When I was a young man, that used to be exciting. It's not exciting anymore. We got here this morning. Well, I shouldn't tell you when we got here. You may think I was speeding. But we got here after the sun rose this morning. And most of you would say that I, it's impossible to preach a sermon having driven all night long. And it is. It's impossible. Unless... You know Jesus. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is the impossible. 
Because every time I stand in the pulpit, I do something that's impossible. Tonight, I'm going to do the impossible with a little bit more at it. And I want to ask you, would you just whisper up an extra prayer? Because this is something special that we need to talk about. And this brain has been on all night long. I think I got an hour's sleep. And that's way less than I need. But how many believe that God can do this thing? All right, all right, that's all I need. Tonight we want to talk about relationships. I, I don't know anything particularly specific about Canada, but I know that most of the places where I go, people are complaining about relationships. Uh, single ladies, I don't want to pick on you, but you are the ones who come to me the most. There are single ladies who tell me to look around the world try to find a man for them. Can you imagine what my life would be like if I had a long list of ladies looking for husbands and everywhere I went I was looking for a husband for the ladies? That would be my whole life. So I've decided that I will not be a dating service. Amen. I will not be a matchmaker. I'll leave that up to Jesus. Amen. But you are the ones I hear from. And let me tell you this. Tonight, I'm going to show you from the Word of God that you are doing some things that are very wrong. In fact, you're going to be surprised that the Bible addresses your strategy and will tell you what to do right. Young men, you are really strange because you don't ask for help until it's too late. You find your own lady, you marry her, and when things go wrong, that's when you come to me. How can I get out of this? And what I got to tell you is, you can't. When you get in, you ought to be careful. Because God does not like divorce. Marriage is for a lifetime. Can I hear somebody say amen to that? When you get married, it's not going in a revolving door. It's a lifetime commitment. So before you say, I do, you ought to be sure you can. So that's what the men do. I've got something to tell you tonight. And then the married folk. Now you can't say a word because you're in here with your husband or your wife. You're going to have to be really quiet now while I'm talking about you. Because if you say one word, your spouse is going to think that something's wrong in the marriage. But there are a lot of married people who secretly sneak to the pastor and say, Are you? Yes. I said, but you look so happy. No. I married the wrong person. <laughs> and, 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 and watch this. The ladies say things like this. He's, he's not the man I thought he was. He, he put on before we got married, and now he's changed completely. He's not the way he was. And the ladies, you know, they've got some things that they've got to bring up as issues. The brethren are kind of strange. When they come, they say, I'm just not excited anymore. She doesn't excite me. Folk, let me tell you something. Where in the world did we learn that marriage is about keeping you high? But people watch television and think that that's what it's about. Tonight, I want to burst some bubbles with the Bible. Can I hear anybody say amen? amen? Turn first with me to Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 4, and verse 19. Now, they've got me in bad shape tonight. I don't know what we're going to do tomorrow night, but I cannot find Bible text with one hand. I can, but it takes too long. So we've got, we got to get another microphone that will help me find my Bible text. I'm pretty fast at it. i got a Bible here that's not expensive. Expensive Bibles are not good for finding text. All of you out there who paid all that money for your Bible with that onion skin paper, you can never find a text. By the time you find it, I'll be three more texts away. But I've got me a nice inexpensive one, and if I can get two hands, I'll find it with lightning speed, but we got to work on that. Here's what the Bible says, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. I want to build
begin by suggesting that the problem with relationships in modern times is that we have come to believe that the way you get your needs supplied is by finding somebody who can do for you what you need done. And I suggest to you that tonight we've got too many relationships that are codependent, depending on somebody to do for you what you need done. There are people who walk around single thinking that they are half a human being. God did not create half human being. Everybody was born whole. Can I hear anybody say amen? So young lady, don't you let anybody, I don't care if it's a relative, tell you, well, you know, you just came into the world and you just gotta wait for the right man. And when you find him, he'll make you whole. So what are you now, half? You're half a lady? No, 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 no. And let me tell you something. I told you I was gonna get in your business. The problem with ladies who walk around feeling like they're half of a human being is that you will scare a man off so fast you'll never have a man Amen. Amen. If there's anything that frightens a man away, it's half a woman waiting to be whole. Men can spot you with their radar. They see you. And as soon as they spot you, they run the other way. Because they can tell that you're waiting for somebody to make you what you are not. And the Bible says that God will supply all your needs. God is the one who does it. And the Bible says that he does it through Jesus Christ. The reason why I'm here preaching in this crusade is because I believe that the problem with us is that we have let our hands slip away. We've let our lives release. The only one who's able to make us whole and that person is Jesus. Gentlemen, let me tell you this. You may think you are all of that, walking around strutting like a peacock. You know how you do. Come on, brethren. And you can get away with it because there's a scarcity of men. So you may not be all that good looking, but you're the only thing left. I'm sorry, brethren, that's just the truth. But let me tell you something. You think that some woman out there can make your life sizzle. She can put you in ecstasy and you stay up there. And then when you get married, you know, for a few days, there is ecstasy. That they have discovered that when two people first meet, there are all kinds of things that happen in your brain. You get so excited when you think you found the right person. You hear birds singing. You see the sun brighter than it ever was. You see the nights more sparkling. The moon gets prettier. The, the, the car sounds better. The colors look brighter. Everything is right when you first meet somebody. But until you find something in that person that is something that can be treasured and valued, until you find something that is meaningful, that Time will wear off. Usually wears off right after the honeymoon. And you're sitting across a table with no food to eat. That can wear that off very quickly. But those who have found in themselves and between themselves the qualities that Jesus puts there. The, 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 the young people sing a song, the Jesus in you loves the Jesus in me. And the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. The best way to make a relationship last is to find somebody who loves Jesus. Amen. Come on, that should have got a better response. Let me be very straight with you. Until you find somebody who loves God, they can never know how to love because the Bible says that God is love. So without God, you can act like you're in love. You can pretend that you're in love. In fact, let me be delicate with this, you can even try to make love. I'm waiting for you. But without God, you can't make love 
because God is love. And brother, let me tell you something. If a woman does not love God and is not faithful to him, she will never be faithful to you. As soon as you leave for work, you'll have that funny feeling in the back of your head. Sister, if he's not faithful to God, he'll never be faithful to you. If God can't trust it, you can't either. So God must be the guarantor. I travel around the world, you've heard that, and, and sometimes I go to places where people make offers and they say, you know, if you would get into this business with me. Well, I'm not gonna get into business with you because I don't know who you are. And they'll say, well, I've got a friend who knows you and who knows me, and that person knows me so well and knows you so well that they can be the guarantor between us. And Sounds good. Thank God I haven't gotten into too many of those. But uh, it, it works. If God is your guarantor, if God knows the man and God knows the woman, then God can bring them together with the power that can make it stick. But God must be the one. If you believe that, can I hear you say amen? amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 37 and verse 4. Psalm 37 and verse 4. You're probably reading these differently than you've read them before, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at old scripture and see if it doesn't make sense in a new way. Psalm 37 and verse 4. And i got to get my two hands. This is not going to work. Going too slowly here. The Bible says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. If you want the desires of your heart, you cannot get your desires in another human being. Your desires come from the Lord. Your desires are found in Him. When you have found Jesus, you can get together with somebody else who's found Jesus, and you can have the greatest joy that your life has ever experienced. But the joys, the desires, the needs are not fulfilled by human beings. We must learn to depend on God for satisfying the things that we need. If you believe that, can I hear you say amen? So let's get away from this belief that somebody can make you happy, like kind of a test. Make me happy. And if you don't make me happy, I'll get tired of you and I'll go find somebody else. When the fact is that nobody can make you anything, the happiness that you desire must come from Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, some of you know that one by heart. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. I'm not doing too bad with one hand. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, the Bible says seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness, and then all of these things will be added. It did not say seek the right man. Seek the right woman, and then you'll get everything you need. Seek the kingdom of heaven, and then all of these things will be added. So you've been doing it wrong. Admit that you've been doing it wrong, and we've got to turn the emphasis around. Put it where it belongs. Let's learn to look to Jesus for our needs, our desires, and all these things that we, we, we need in our lives. And if you seek them from the right source, then you'll find the right person. Now, ladies, here comes my secret tonight, and I should charge you for this. I told you already that what drives a man away is a woman who's looking, looking for the other half. Half a woman looking. And you stand around looking, and every man knows that look. So when you come, they run. Well, sister, let me tell you what you need to do. Do what the Bible said. Let Jesus supply all your needs. Let Jesus give you the desires of your heart. Seek him first, and he'll add all things after that. Then you'll be so happy that you will not walk around looking for somebody to make you whole. You will already be whole, happy, fulfilled, your desires met, your needs met, and everything supplied by Jesus. Do you know what gets a man excited more than anything else in a woman? Is to see a woman who doesn't need him. 
Brethren, I'm sorry I told that, but that's the truth. <laughs> if when the brethren come around and say, hey, how you doing? And keep on doing what you're doing. Amen. You know, he thinks he's so attractive that you can't ignore him. Don't ignore him. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Yes. You're happy in Jesus. Yes. Your needs are met. Your desires are fulfilled. You got everything you need in Christ. So just keep on doing what you're doing. And then he'll come back again. Uh, excuse me. You, you know, I, I said something. I said, well, I heard you. God bless you. Good to meet you. I got to do something now. And just keep on moving. He'll chase you all over the world. If you've already got your needs met. Now you can chip that one in stone because it is immutable. If you act like you've already got who you need in your life, you will attract everybody you want and a couple you don't want. But you've got to start off by being happy in Jesus. Now, let me talk to the brothers. I wish the sisters could close their ears, but they can't. Brother, if you want to be an attractive man, stop looking for the models on television. Stop trying to walk tall and look straight and make money and be what you really are not and be what God wants you to be. Amen. Satisfy Jesus. And let me tell you why you ought to satisfy Jesus, my brother. Because you can't satisfy the sisters anyway. Some of them want you to be rough. So you... I'm a man. And then you meet a woman, she said, but I'm looking for a man who can be rough and gentle. <laughs> now you gotta be, okay, then. I'm gentle. Then you meet somebody and say, you don't act like a real man. You act like you're too gentle. And now you don't know what to do. You'll be rough today and gentle tomorrow. <laughs> you wanna be tall today and kind of get over tomorrow. You wanna make a lot of money today and then be humble tomorrow. You'll find out that you can't satisfy the whims of every person you meet. So why don't you stop trying to satisfy all the women in the world and satisfy Jesus. Amen. Satisfy Jesus. And let me tell you why you ought to satisfy Jesus, my brother. Because you can't satisfy the sisters anyway. <laughs> Some of them want you to be rough. So you, <laughs> I'm a man. And then you meet a woman, she said, but I'm looking for a man who can be rough and gentle. Now you gotta be, okay then, I'm gentle. Then you meet somebody and say, you don't act like a real man. You act like you too gentle. And now you don't know what to do. You'll be rough today and gentle tomorrow. You wanna be tall today and kind of get over tomorrow. You wanna make a lot of money today and then be humble tomorrow. You'll find out that you can't satisfy the whims of every person you meet. So why don't you stop trying to satisfy all the women in the world and satisfy Jesus. Yeah. Jesus will make you stand tall. Jesus will put a, a genuine smile on your face. He'll give you your needs. He'll supply your desires. And when a man is happy in Jesus, women get excited. And let me tell you why you ought to satisfy Jesus, my brother. Because you can't satisfy the sisters anyway. Some of them want you to be rough. So you, I'm a man. And then you meet a woman, she said, but I'm looking for a man who can be rough and gentle. Now you gotta be, okay then, I'm gentle. And then you meet somebody and say, you don't act like a real man. You act like you too gentle. And now you don't know what to do. You'll be rough today and gentle tomorrow. You wanna be tall today and kind of get over tomorrow. You want to make a lot of money today and then be humble tomorrow? You'll find out that you can't satisfy the whims of every person you meet. So why don't you stop trying to satisfy all the women in the world and satisfy Jesus? Yeah. Jesus will make you stand tall. Jesus will put a, a genuine smile on your face. He'll give you your needs. He'll supply your desires. And when a man is happy in Jesus, women get excited. You may not be the most handsome man in the world, but when Jesus touches you, oh, my brother, you look good. Amen. I have baptized people all around the world who were not attractive when I baptized them. <laughs> but when you serve Jesus, your eyes get clear. Amen. And, and, and your face clears up because you're doing what's right in you getting sleep for the first time in your life. And you're not running and hiding so you don't look like this anymore. You look like this. Amen. Happy.
happy in Jesus. And the lady singing said, I never, I did, I've watched him before, but I never saw him looking that good. And it's because Jesus will add to your stature. Seek the kingdom of heaven first, and God will add all of these things to you. So, you understand what I'm saying. Now, the Apostle Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about the gift of singleness. And I'm going to be, well, I need to read this for you. Because some of the single folk are amazing. I know you didn't come here for this. You thought we were just going to have fun. But the Bible is a two-edged sword. It cuts every now and then. Amen? Amen. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7. I would that all men were even as my, I myself, but every man hath, a, hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and one after that. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and read the next two verses, it says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that if they abide even as I. That was Paul when he was singing. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. You got quiet, but I, the, 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 the scholars have looked at that text. They are split in their opinion. One group of scholars says it is better to marry than to burn with desire. If you know you have a desire that needs to be satisfied in that particular area of your life, you do not have the gift of singleness. Are we together? But you might, you're too quiet. There's something wrong. Am I coming too close to your existence? Some people need to be married. Now what this text is simply saying is that you can't have it both ways. You can't have the gift of singleness and the gift of marriage too. There are some people who do not want to commit to a marriage, but they want to have all of the auspices of marriage. So they move from one situation to another and create many marriages. M-I-N-I. -N -I. The Bible says if that's what you've got to have, then it's better, better to marry than to burn. The other scholars say it's better to marry than to burn in Hades after you have turned your life inside out. But you've got to decide whether you are a person who needs to be married or whether you are a person who needs to be single. Are we together? The Bible says so. In fact, let me add one more text to it and then you can stop being nervous. <laughs> I can tell that you are. Now, let me add two. Look at verse 34 in that same chapter. It says this, there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. The Bible says that there are some people, and this was written a long time ago, or else it would be gender neutral. There are some people who do not have the gift of marriage. They have the gift of singleness. It is a blessing for them because they can give their attention to the things of the Lord. Amen. If that's what gift you have, remember that the reason why you have the gift is so that you can give attention to the things of the Lord. You are not single so that you can dip into everybody else's marriage. I got your attention now, didn't I? You know, there are some people you can't have around when you are married. But that is, that is not according to God's word. You've got to determine which is your gift. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 10. Matthew chapter 19. And verse 10, and single folk, I'm going to actually back off of you, but you know you always say, in fact, I've preached all around, and folks say, well, you don't ever say anything about single people. Well, I did tonight, didn't I? I don't know whether you enjoyed all of it, but it's the truth anyhow. Matthew chapter 19, verse 10, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. There are some people, even according to the word of God, who are not good candidates for marriage. And people need to decide whether your gift is a gift of singleness or a gift of marriage. And once you have decided that, you know how to conduct yourself. This is what the Bible says to single people. Now let me talk about married people for a moment. 
And I told you that you've got to be quiet. This may be one of the quietest times in the sermon, unless the single folk want to say amen for you. They may want to do that. But there are some people who have gotten married thinking that being married to somebody would answer all of your needs. It does not. Your needs are answered in Christ. However, there are some things that marriage is intended to do. Number one, marriage ought to take away your loneliness. Amen, somebody. Amen. Terrible thing to be married and still lonely. <laughs> well, I knew it would be quiet. I didn't know it would be that quiet, but there it is. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And let's see what the original plan was. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Come on, brethren, you ought to say amen to that part of the text. Amen. Men have a hard time being alone. Men can't find anything. Come on, brethren. Grew up with your mom knowing where everything was. You don't know where the forks are. You don't know where the, the towels are. You don't know where anything is. You've had a woman to, to, to be the administrator of your life for all that time. And so you, you can't be single because you've got to have somebody to find stuff. So you go get married so somebody can find stuff for you. That is not a good basis upon which to build a marriage. Can somebody say amen? amen. I, I think I heard Dr. Kuzma say something very close to that. You get down to maintenance conversation and all you do is, uh, you see where I put my hand? Mm -hmm. You see my comb? Mm -hmm. Did you see where I put the flashlight? No, that's not marriage. You could, you could hire somebody to do that. The Bible says it is not good that the man. Now, if it were written now, it would say that it is not good for men and women to be alone. The, the optimum state, according to this text, is, go back to verse 19, I will make and help meet for him. A whole lot of things happen uh, theologically with help meet. But God simply says, in order to quelch, to squelch loneliness, I will make a, a woman, I will make a help meet for him. The Bible suggests that. I don't know, you folk got to help me out. But I, have read, I read the Bible a little differently perhaps than some. I don't think that, that marriage is just a theological institution. I believe that God intended that husbands and wives should be happy together. It worries me when I can look in a car in front of me at a stoplight and the way that I can tell whether these two people are married or not is that if they are leaning close together and hugging on each other while they're waiting for the light to change and then you gotta blow your horn to tell them it's time to move. So let me ask you, are they married or not? You see what I mean? Now, if they're stopped at the stoplight and the husband is pressed on his door, holding the steering wheel, and the wife is pressed on her door, are they married or not? traveling and, and, and he had told the king that he and his wife were brother and sister but as time went by Isaac had to kind of say you know Rebecca it's getting kind of long here in the kingdom and we told this story that's not true you are my sister in Christ but you're not really my sister let's get together and the Bible says that one day the king looked out of the window and saw Isaac with his wife, and he said, wait a minute, these folks are not brother and sister. They look too happy together. And the Bible does not suggest that anything was going on in public that should not have been going on. It was just that they were so happy together that the king said, these people are not brother and sister. 
they are husband and wife. He could tell that they were married because they seemed happy together. We look at television and television has made us believe and I'm not giving you something off the top of my head. I'm giving you scientific survey that has said that children are given the wrong impression in their Christian homes because everybody they see who is happy together is not married. The people who are happy together on television are sneaking some way. The people who are happy together on television are seeing somebody that they should not see. But when you see mom and dad, they just come in and say, How you doing? Are you doing all right? Uh -uh. And the most they see out of their mom and dad is, they may go by and say, What are you going to have for dinner for now tonight? That's not love. Are we together? Well, you, you don't want to take my word for it. Go to Ecclesiastes. Let's find it in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9. It says it in the Bible. In fact, you ought to go home tonight and discuss it. If you're married and you're not happy, you're not obeying the word of God. Ecclesiastes 9 9 says, Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy vanity, which he has given thee under the sun. All the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. The Bible says it's, it's a command. Live joyful. Husbands and wives, I dare you when you leave this place. Brother, grab that lady's hand like you used to. See what it feels like after a few years. Huh? Who wrote the rule that said, when you're dating, you can be all huggy-huggy, but then when you get married, mm, walk over there. And she looks like she agrees. Well, good. I'm glad you went there. You walk over there. So you're not touching it. I dare you. I dare you, brother. I dare you before you go home tonight, stop by one of those little places that you used to stop by. Pick up a little sweet sunset. Or if she doesn't want to have something sweet because she's on her eternal diet. <laughs> Surprise her tomorrow with a little sweet card and put it in the bedroom where she can find it. It will shock her to death. She won't know. She'll think somebody broke in the house. <laughs> but you ought to live joyfully with the wife. Is, is there anybody who say amen to this? Yeah. Am I preaching the truth or what? Live joyful, sister. I dare you to do some of those things you used to do. Remember that little thing you used to wear? Now that's all in your mind. I don't know what you used to wear. Slip it back on. Live joyfully with the wife of your youth. Husbands and wives ought to be happy. The Bible commands it. Can I hear somebody say amen? Your children ought to be able to say, my mother and father love each other. Children ought not have to make the decision as they are now making that if you want to be happy, the only way to be happy is to sneak out with somebody and do it illegally. The Bible says it ought not be so. Well, I've got to... I've got to close this out because I want you to be back tomorrow night. But I'll tell you this. The thing that disturbs me most about marriages today is not how they begin. Well, let me take that back. What you begin well ends well. The fact is that marriages are not traditional always. But men ought to be men of integrity. Bible says that a man ought to take care of his household. Amen. A man who does not take care of his household is worse than an infidel. Amen. I'm getting a little disturbed at men who want to be married but they don't want a job. Amen. Brother, if you are big and bad enough to ask for her hand in marriage, you should put your hand to labor. Amen. I am disturbed at the distortions that are coming now.
when people think that all you've got to do is show up with pants on and that makes you a man. And sister, let me talk to you for a minute. I'm a little disturbed now with people who think that when you get married, all you got to do is sit there and vegetate. Just wait on your man to bring joy and happiness and money and everything. If you are in a traditional marriage, you ought to be taking care of your home. The Bible says in Proverbs that you ought to be a woman who is wise with the time. You ought not wake up in the morning and then go back to sleep, but you ought to be busy making your home a beautiful place. But if you're not in a traditional marriage, if you're in a contemporary marriage, then you probably have a job. And the fact is that it generally takes two incomes these days to make a marriage work. So you ought to be developing yourself and the Bible says that Jesus did in Luke 2.52 in wisdom, that is develop your mind, in stature, develop your body, in favor with God, keep your spirituality high, and in favor with man, your personality ought to stay sweet. Amen. I'm disturbed at people who think that you groom yourself until you get married and then let yourself go. That's not the way God planned. In fact, let's talk about how God planned it before we go tonight. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, back there, and look at verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're looking for, well, if I get out of Chronicles, it'll work. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Do benevolence, kindness. It's time for some civility to come back into relationships. Amen. You can't woo your spouse with beauty and joy, and then when you get them, treat them like they are no longer important in your life. Amen. The same sweet things that you said before ought to get even better after you are married, Amen. because now that person is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. We ought to have more civility, more kindness. The Bible says that it ought to happen mutually. You can't live your life in a Jerry Springer world and think that you're going to somehow mysteriously have the love that Jesus talks about. In fact, let me take this moment to announce to you for the next few nights that we are together in this building. I'd like to invite you to bring your friends. I'd like to invite you to bring your loved ones because I think it's time for somebody to stand up and do it God's way. Amen. I read the other day a statement that said everybody has come out of the closet except Christians. Think about it. You look at television, people with all kinds of aberrant behavior. I just want to come out and tell everybody this is my problem. And you sit there crazy enough to look at it. You talk about the show, but you look at it. Everybody is, is they're no longer ashamed. The only people in the closet are Christians. We are ashamed to tell people that we love Jesus. We're ashamed to let them know that we do not live like everybody else lives. We're ashamed to let them know that when you put Jesus in your life, your life changes. Jesus will change things for you. You cannot have him in your life and be the same. And I tell you this, that if you're not ready to stand up and be counted in the name of Christ, then you will be uncomfortable here because I think it's time for those who believe in Christ to stand up and be counted. In a relationship, let's look at what God in, intends for it to happen. God hates divorce. He wants mutual love and respect. And then it doesn't depend on possessions. It doesn't depend on any of that. Instead, it depends on having a partner. And this is what Jesus has to say. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. I believe I can do it with that text and close us for tonight. They've got a big clock out there in front of me. Aren't you happy? That lets me know when it's time to leave. For this cause, verse 31, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too 
shall be one flesh. Let me share with you what I believe God wants us to see as our model today. If you could subtract the television model from your mind, Jesus says, I am the husband and I'm coming back for a bride. And guess what that bride is represented to be in the symbolism of prophecy? The church. The church, simply ecclesia, the ones who are called out from the world to be God's children, to be brothers and sisters of Christ. We are the church, and the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus gave himself for us as the church. Jesus loves us with an undying love, and even with our faults and our blemishes, he does not cast us out when he discovers our problems, but instead his love draws the best from us, and he makes us what we ought to be in order to be a fit bride. Amen. If husbands and wives, if people who claim they are in love could take away the television images and remember how Jesus treats his bride, relationships would change instantly. Tonight, I believe that Jesus is about to come back for his bride. The Bible says, and this is John speaking now, he says, I saw the city, New Jerusalem, adorned as a bride ready for a husband, coming down from God out of heaven. The fact is that this momentous hour in earth's history is a time when Jesus is about to come back to take his bride. And if we would think about relationships in that fashion, and if we would remember tonight that Jesus is about to come back for the bride, and the bride is all of us together, not only would it tell us that we ought to live right and enjoy marriage, but we ought to live right so that we can be ready for the day when Jesus comes. I travel around this world enough to know that Jesus coming cannot be far off. There are too many things that are going too wrong for this earth to keep on like it's going. Jesus is about to come. When the bridegroom appears, the bride must be ready. I want to be in that number. How about you? I want to be in a relationship that reflects the love of Christ. How about you? No matter what your relationship tonight, if you're a single parent and you want to have the relationship with your children that Jesus can be proud of, if you are single without children but you want to be the kind of example that you ought to be, if you are a single person looking for a mate, but you want to find the one that Jesus has for you. If you're a married person who wants your marriage to reflect the relationship between Jesus and his church, I'd like to ask you tonight, if you want your relationship to reflect Christ, would you just stand where you are as we pray before we leave tonight? We'd like to pray tonight for relationships. Father in heaven, search this auditorium. There are husbands and wives tonight who've lost their love. But in the very moment while we're praying, you can help them to remember why they fell in love in the first place. You can help them remember the attributes that drew them together long ago. I beg of you, Father, to rekindle love in someone's marriage tonight. There is someone tonight looking for the right mate Father, guide them just as surely as you guided the prophets of old, the patriarchs. The way you selected mates for them was miraculous. And I know that God does not change, so tonight you can find the right mate for someone who is looking for a Christian mate. Father, do that to show them your power. Give them the patience to wait. Give them the ability to, to reflect your love. And as they do that, you search, you look. You bring them together. There's a single parent here tonight, a single mother who doesn't seem to have anybody to help her, but, but Jesus is there. And so, Father, I beg of you to give her the, the ingenuity and the creativity to be a good parent all alone. There's some gentleman here tonight who must rear his children by himself. Give to him the wisdom that he must have in order to be a mother and a father. And then, Father, there are people tonight 
who seem to have no hope. They've lost faith in love. They don't believe that real love exists. They have given up on a relationship. Father, tonight, touch them with the power of your touch and help them to know that God is love. And if God is in the heart, then people who have given up on love can find love, not in society, but in Jesus. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. amen. Now until tomorrow night, may God hear you when you call. May God lift you if you fall. May God bless you as you stand. May God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night and God bless you.